guys are you know, juniors. You got like a year to worry about it. So what's the, what's the rush? It's not really something to be excited about. <coughs> I'm not excited about it. <laughs> He's a sophomore. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. What? Like, I'm, I'm like a junior. Like, I skipped a year, but this is only my second year here. Okay. Yeah. Sophomore. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're in an extra rush. So you can go ten years. <laughs> 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 He's already got a ten years. <laughs> schedule, but I just wanted to remind you guys that uh, just wanted to remind you guys that I am going to be out on Monday. Um, I'm at another conference, and so I will be putting up another one of those screencast lecture dubios for Monday, and then uh, to get through most of the remaining material uh, from Chapter Seven. And then we'll wrap up chapter seven on Wednesday before the break. Uh, so today, what I want to talk about is kind of how we tie some of the ideas that we've, you know, we, we've dealt so far with dimensional analysis, right? The idea that if you have some functional relationship of u1, an unknown function of u2, u3, dot, 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 uk, and if you can describe all these terms using R dimensions, then by applying the Buckingham Pi theorem, right, uh, or, or this dimensional analysis procedure that we went through, which is eight steps, then what you can get is a new relationship using these dimensionless Pi terms. We have pi 1 is a function of pi 2, pi 3, all the way to pi k minus r. Now this is a useful thing to know for two reasons. Uh, one is that you have fewer terms now. Fewer terms means that it's easier to explore experimentally. All right, it's easier to look at a problem that only varies as a function of one parameter than it is to look at a problem that varies as a function of four parameters because you have a, essentially a two-dimensional space versus a five-dimensional space to explore is your uh, experimental space. The other thing that's useful about this is the fact that these are dimensionless, as I said, because that means that they're independent of the system of units you use or even the size of the system you're considering. Uh, and so this is, those two considerations are what make, A, experiments easier to run, and B, what makes the results that you get out of a, a, a relationship like this more um, generally applicable, it will allow us to do model testing. So I'm going to try to link these two ideas together today and uh, show you how some of the ideas of model testing come from that. Um, so just to remind you guys, uh, from the booking of Pi Theorem begins by listing all the variables that are involved in your problem. This requires that you have some understanding of the physics going on. Uh, it's a fairly intuition-based process. You don't need to have a real deep understanding of how all of the different variables play into the, uh, that problem. And you don't need to know any like mathematical expressions. For, for F. You just need to list them out. It's a literally a brainstorming session. And then you expand them all in terms of your basic dimension system. Mass, length, time, temperature. Count those up to see how many dimensions you have. Label that R. So by Buckingham Pi Theorem tells us that we can get K minus R dimensionless Pi terms. Uh, then the method of repeating variables, which is the one we talked about, says you pick a number of called repeating variables that are A, independent of one another, that is, you can't combine any number of them to create another one in the set. 
and two, they have to represent all of, between them, they have to represent all of the, uh, the dimensions that are in your dimension expansion. Okay, uh, so if you have, if, if your variables here involve some mass, some length, and some time units, then your repeating variables have to contain mass, length, and time, in addition to being independent from one another. Then pi terms are formed by taking your non-repeating variables one at a time, just sequentially, and multiplying them by your repeating variables raised to some arbitrary powers. Then you just solve for unknown coefficients. So if you've got your non-repeating variable, u1, and say you've got three repeating variables, u2, u3, u4, you raise these to powers that you do not yet know. And you say this is going to be equal to mass at zero, length at zero, time to the zero, and you solve for a, b, and c. So doing that one at a time will get you each of these pi terms. Um, so if you do this with enough problems, you'll find that there tends to be kind of a, there, there are a few pi terms that show up a lot in fluids problems. Uh, at least in some form or another. Maybe it's the square root of one of them, maybe it's one over one of them, but uh, there's a list of sort of standard pi terms that occur so often that we give them these special names. Uh, and I'd like to first, I want to go through these and kind of explain what they really signify. Right? So we've got the Reynolds number, the Froude number, the Euler number, Cauchy number, we're not going to talk about Cauchy number. Mach number, Struhal number, and Weber number. Um, you might have heard of some of these in the past, but they're, they probably lack a lot of uh, intuition. So, for the next, uh, for the first half of the lecture, so we're going to just crunch through these numbers and sort of explore what they signify about a problem. So, the Reynolds number is what results from just about any pi term that involves density, velocity, viscosity, and some length scale. Now what you choose to be your length scale isn't that important. That's going to change from problem to problem. The idea is it just needs to have dimensions of length. So if you're dealing with pipe flow, this will often be the diameter. If you're dealing with ship flow over a ship, this will often be the length along the water line. Okay. But what this tells you, essentially, is the relative importance of inertial forces to viscous forces. If you think about um, any dynamical system, anything that, 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 where there's motion being produced, we've been basing it all on you know, the, the uh, conservation of linear momentum, which tells us F equals MA. If you think about it, this here, this is inertial. This we don't really specify where this force comes from. So what this is telling us now is if we say this is the force due to viscous terms, viscous dependent force, and we uh, bring it over here, if we divide both sides by F, we end up with the inertial term divided by the viscous term, then what we'll get is something that is um, not necessarily that will affect, I shouldn't say that. Uh, that this will vary uh, with a problem in a similar way to the Reynolds number. Now I want to be clear, this isn't a, this isn't like a hard and fast expression. This doesn't say, you don't get a Reynolds number of 20 and you say the, uh, the inertial forces are 20 times as important as the viscous forces. It's much more loose than that because you have some leeway in how you choose this length scale and what velocities you use. Instead, you'll say for a problem where the Reynolds number is 1. Right? Or I'll, I can show you actually in this video here. For very low Reynolds numbers, what this means is that viscous forces tend to dominate. So, for example, if you take like a bucket of paint and you stick a dot in it and you rotate this thing around, you choose the velocity scale maybe to be the circumferential velocity here the length scale to be the diameter, then what you'll see is that, um, let me start that over, that the, uh, the forces, especially those on this little, this little 
element here tend to be mostly viscous. That is, when the bucket stops suddenly, so does the dot. At a higher Reynolds number, that is, when inertial forces are less important relative to viscous forces, then you can see that the momentum, the angular momentum of this little dot continues to carry it around the bucket as it stops. That's because, uh, or sorry, inertial forces become more important for higher Reynolds numbers. Um, so the Reynolds number is really useful for cases where you have one system and you say, look, it's operating at a Reynolds number of one in this case and a Reynolds number of 100 in this case. In which case do we need to worry more about the effects of viscosity and in which cases can we ignore them? Okay. So one of the reasons that, um, for example, aerodynamicists and, and aerospace designers often don't have to worry that much about the Reynolds number is because they're dealing with uh, very high velocities, relatively large length scales, and small uh, dynamic viscosities. Air is not a very viscous fluid, right? So they end up with really, really, really large Reynolds numbers, stuff up in the, you know, tens of millions, which signifies that inertial forces dominate the problem. And there are cases with, like that, or in cases, or those sorts of cases, you can often just say, all right, so the Reynolds number at this point doesn't become important. The, 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 the change from 10 million to 100 million is big, uh, is, it signifies a big number, but in both cases, I don't have to worry that much about the viscosity. And so I, you can usually cut the vis viscosity terms out of the problem entirely. So Reynolds number, that's one. Here's another one that we worry about a lot as, uh, as naval architects. Right, you've got a ship traveling through the water. It's operating at the interface between two fluids, a very light one and a very dense one, air and water. Now the ship is making waves. Waves require energy to generate, and therefore they're going to suck energy out of whatever your, your propulsion of the ship is in order to make those waves. Um, now, the relative importance of the waves you're generating depends upon the density of the fluid, right? How much mass is contained in that fluid you're moving around, and the gravity of the fluid. That is the restoring force on the waves themselves. If you think about a wave as being some perturbation about a previously, this is your free surface, before there are any waves, and this is a free surface with waves, then what you've essentially got here is areas where you've got buoyancy and areas where you've got weight, right? And in both these cases, it's going to be proportional to the density of the fluid and gravitational acceleration. It's restoring forces on each element. So if you're this, uh, this nifty bearded fellow here, you suggest that maybe we can uh, take the relative importance of inertial forces, again, what's on the right hand side here, to gravitational forces, or the weight of objects, and represent it by what we call the Froude number. This is the velocity over the square root of gravity times, again, some length scale we pick. Naval architecture, once again, length here is usually the length of the ship along the water line. If you're dealing with a problem like this mason jar, which for some reason somebody's shaking violently, uh, then your length scale in this case would be the diameter of the jar. Uh, the uh, I, I really I just want to I want to make sure that you guys uh, walk out of here understanding that that this is not really a hard a hard science. These these pi terms are not set in stone in the sense that you always have to pick a specific length scale or a specific velocity. Uh, it's more a case of uh, you have to look at the problem and pick ones that seem appropriate for the things that you're concerned about. For example, if you've got, uh, let's see, if you've got flow through a propeller, maybe, let's say we've got a uh, Um, if 
you've got flow through propeller. Let's say we'll call this U infinity, that is the upstream. And then as it passes through the propeller, that flow is going to contract and accelerate. And you're going to end up with um, UW, that's the velocity in the wake. Um, then you have to pick, for example, what you want your length scale to be. If you, this, this propeller we're assuming is probably attached to a ship, right? That's a pretty bad size <laughs> propeller. <laughs> it's a, the fastest ship. This is a surface piercing propeller, I forgot to mention. Uh, so, in the, if for, if, if for example, if you're looking at Reynolds number effects, okay, and you're interested in the drag on the hull, you're going to want your velocity of interest to be um, the forward velocity of the ship, which I set this up very badly. Uh, well, let's call this, um, usually say this is U uh, A, the advanced velocity. So, and then this is U S, the ship velocity. Um, if you're interested in the drag effects on the, the ship hull, then you're going to pick for both your Reynolds number and your crude number the ship's forward speed and the ship's length along the waterline uh, as, your, as your velocity and length scales. However, if you're interested in something more detailed, if you take the same ship and you want to zoom in on a different part of it and look at the effects of viscosity on propeller performance, then instead you're probably going to pick the diameter of the propeller as your length scale, and for the velocity, you might pick the wake, or the inflow speed, or even the diameter times its, uh, its angular velocity, which has units of velocity, right? That's the circumferential velocity of the tip. So you have some leeway in how you pick the, the variables that go into these. Um, just like you have leeway in how you pick the variables that, that go into your initial functional relationship. <coughs> you don't know the functional relationship, but the idea is by looking at the problem carefully, you list out the dimensional variables you think you need, uh, and if you manipulate it well enough, then you end up with forms of the Reynolds number, Froude number, etc., that kind of determine uh, how, rel how the relative importance of different effects in your system of interest. Um, so there's Reynolds number, Froude number, Another one we call the Cauchy number, or sorry, Euler number. This is the Euler number. Uh, so the Euler number tells us how important uh, compression forces are, sort of the springiness of a fluid uh, relative to the inertial forces. Now, in in, uh, in in an incompressible fluid, you might say, well, the fluid isn't springy; it's incompressible. You know, we don't. There isn't going to be a, uh, we don't have to worry very much about compressibility effects, but um, I got that wrong. Sorry, not the springiness of the fluid. We're just talking about straight up pressure right now. So um, this is more potential energy versus kinetic energy. And the one, the version of the Euler number that we, uh, the general version of the Euler number is just pressure. Some pressure term divided by density times velocity squared. Um, in hydro, we most often use a very specific form of the Euler number that we call the cavitation number. And this is the difference between the pressure in a fluid and the saturated vapor pressure of that fluid. So in water, um, usually if you have water at about room temperature, you might have P infinity would be um, something close to atmospheric pressure, maybe plus some hydrostatic pressure, it's far under water. And the saturated vapor pressure is around two and a half to three kilopascals. So what usually happens in this case is you have something like 100 kilopascals or, you know, more. 100 plus kilopascals minus about three kilopascals divided by one half rho v squared. And when this number gets small enough, then what you end up getting is cavitation or this sort of spontaneous boiling of the liquid. Because this tells us that the, the, the pressure in the fluid gets close enough to uh, the vapor pressure that, um, uh, that the drop in pressure, that the, the small pockets flow where the pressures get small, uh, following from Bernoulli's equation, uh, may actually become smaller than the vapor pressure. 
And so this is an example of the, uh, the kind of, it doesn't show up very well. Uh, for example, I showed this video once before. Uh, this is from my recent work over in Rome, uh, where I put this big surface piercing hydrofoil into a cavitation tunnel. And what this allowed us to do was you say, well, I'm working with water, and I know how fast I want to go. That, so that pretty much fixes the vapor pressure and density, and then you know your operating conditions, your, your, your velocity is fixed um, by your the design of your experiment. So if you want to vary the cavitation number without changing any of these other things, then what you got to do is you have to put this whole thing to a variable pressure tunnel. And so in this situation, um, Involved. I actually have a really good picture of this. Uh, in, in Rome, they have this uh, pretty remarkable facility uh, called Free Surface Cavitation Tunnel. And So I got to take I got to climb around in this cavitation tunnel with my phone when I was in Rome. So this is a big flow channel, right? These are the windows through which you observe the flow. The idea is you have about this 30 ton steel lid that they lift onto the top here and they put on top. It's got the rubber seals that run around. Uh, it's a hydraulic sealing system. So you fill it up partially with water. This right here, you see, is that hydrofoil I was showing you in the last video. It's about yay by yay large. Uh, so this is about 12 feet across by about 10, eight, eight, eight and a half feet deep uh, by 30 feet long. And uh, so you fill it up partially with water, you set that water moving, and then with this lid lifted onto the top, it's completely sealed, and they turn on these pumps. And they can actually evacuate 96% of the air, right? So they can take it down to about 4% of atmospheric pressure. What that means is that you can pull it down to about uh, 40, or so to about 4 kilopascals ambient pressure. That make, means that your okay. That means this term here approaches about four kilopascals. This becomes about, this is about two and a half to three kilopascals. That's a much smaller difference now than 100 kilopascals minus three kilopascals. And remember from the Bernoulli equation, velocity goes up, pressure goes down. So what this means is that in areas where the velocity gets particular high, particularly high, such as in the tip vortices of a propeller or in the flow over the suction side of a hydrofoil, that now the gas, or now the, uh, the, the liquid goes, reaches its saturated vapor pressure and boils at room temperature, but it boils by a reduction in the pressure. It essentially tears the fluid apart, the, the low pressures. And so I think that this is a, this is, yeah. I was wondering, what's the point of having uh, such, such a small margin between pressures? Because the reason is, and we'll get into this, it's a good question. Um, this is kind of what I want to wrap up with, is that it's not, when you're doing model testing, for example, if you're doing testing on a propeller, um, model testing, as I'm about to show you, requires that you, uh, when you're, if you have like a dimensional analysis like this, if you want to know how a full-scale system acts, but all you can do is test a model, then what you have to do is make sure that all of your pi terms are equal. If 
query model as a yeah. very full scale system. And that means if you scale down the, the size, then you're going to have to do something with the velocity, you're going to have to do something with uh, the rotational speed. Um, and what happens is a lot of the time, because we usually only are able to use water, we only have certain, so many things we can play with in the problem. So we end up saying, like, okay, I can match pi 2, I can match pi 3, uh oh, pi 4, I can't match, which may be the cavitation number. And so the only way you can do that is by finding another way of playing with um, the terms in the cavitation number. In this case, that's why they invented cavitation tunnels, is so that they could do model testing. So the reason is usually um, the, the, the speed that you run a model at is, is smaller than than it full scale. And so your V squared term on the bottom isn't the same for a model as it would be for a, a full scale ratio, right? So you're trying to get that ratio the same. You're trying to say, I want my model to have the same balance between pressure forces and inertial forces as in the full scale system. Um, so, and, and so that, that's almost a perfect segue. If you let me get through these last couple slides. Uh, Next one, we don't worry about this very much, Mach number. This is the one I was, I was spouting off about accidentally earlier. Um, inertial force relative to compressibility forces. This is the springiness of, of fluid. Uh, the Mach number is what dictates when you cross the speed of sound, basically. Velocity divided by speed of sound. Um, and so you end up with like subsonic, supersonic, or transonic, supersonic operations. Um, Again, in fluids, the speed of sound is really, really, really high, so we don't often go supersonic in fluids. Uh, but in aerospace, this is definitely a thing. That's why you end up with these uh, these Mach cones or these compressibility cones when when uh, aircraft break the sound barrier. And uh, generally, uh, this is sort of where we are able to uh, justify. Um, Compressibility uh, assumptions, usually if the Mach number is less than 0.3, that is if your velocity of interest is going less than 30% of the speed of sound, then you don't have to worry very much about compressibility. This is true of, of, of aircraft too, right? Um, so very slow aircraft, your little, your little Cessna single engines that cruise around at like 120 miles an hour, you don't have to, if, if you're right now the uh, governing equations of that, you don't have to worry about compressibility. It's not going fast enough. The air can essentially move out of the way quickly enough. That is, your inertial forces are small enough um, relative to your compressibility forces that uh, it's, the air isn't going to get compressed. On the other hand, if you invented a, uh, a, a, a um, wakeboarding boat that did 40% of the speed of sound, uh, you'd have to start worrying about the compressibility of the water itself. Which would be tough to do. Um, how would you how would you account for the both fluids for the air and for the water? That's a good question. Uh, it depends on what fluid you're more. Do you think is going to affect the problem more? Right. So, like for a ship, um, wind resistance tends to be smaller, a lot smaller than than the, the hydrodynamic resistance. Right. So you'd have to solve it kind of two two steps. Um, this one we generally aren't as, uh, we, don't, we don't see as much, we're not going to work as much with, in this class, but the Struhall number um, has to do with uh, unsteady flows. Um, it gives us the relative importance of local inertial forces to convective inertial forces. Remember, if you write out the material derivative, you end up with an unsteady term and a convective term. So if you take the ratio of those two, what it tells you is how important the time varying aspect of the flow is relative to the relative the steady flow, and uh, so when you end up with things like um, this, generally came, this came from originally the study of what they called singing wires, um, where when you have a circular or a relatively bluff body in a flow, you end up with this alternating shedding of vorticity off the back of the body. Uh, and this is what's specifically known as a von Karman vortex street, uh, courtesy of this, this dude here. Um, so we'd write this as the frequency, the angular frequency of whatever your unsteady periodic effect is. In this case, if you count up how the frequency of these alternating vortices being shed off the body, plug that in there. Choose a length scale, say the width of the body here, 
and then pick a velocity, what you're going to get is a number that tells you the relative, uh, what is it? the relative influence of the unsteadiness caused by the vortex shedding relative to the, uh, the importance of the steady flow in the background. And finally, I think this is the last of them, um, the Weber number. Now the Weber number tells us about the balance between inertial forces and surface tension. So for example, if we take a little soap bubble like that here in the lower right corner and we poke it with a needle, what you end up seeing is that it sort of, the, the, the interface, the, the, the breached portion of the bubble gets gets pulled around the, um, the circumference of the bubble, right? So it's surface tension that's causing that kind of propagation and how quickly the bubble is shrinking along the surface because once you break it, you have unbalanced surface tension forces which causes the bubble surface to try to pull into a point. But the inertia of the bubble film dictates how quickly that can happen. And so, uh, and so, by balancing the, the uh, oh, this is the wrong, we're supposed to use gamma there, I thought. Um, anyway, Weber number uh, written as density, velocity squared, some length scale over your surface tension constant will tell you how much you have to worry about uh, the surface tension forces versus your, uns your, your MA term. Uh, we don't worry about Weber number very often with ships because usually, Surface tension is quite a small effect. Our length scales and velocity scales with ships tends to be quite large. And so this tells us that with large Weber numbers, those greater than about 100 for most problems, if you look at problems, say Weber numbers over 100, um, usually you say, well, the surface tension is becoming marginal. It's becoming of secondary importance. Uh, the only real time that we see surface tension effects coming in uh, is with like sloshing of tanks that have uh, like very, very odd fluids in them, or with capillary waves. If you have a bunch of really tiny waves, ripples, right? Um, in fact, the, 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 uh, if, if, if you shrink these waves down to a very small size, then what you end up with is this curvature here. Um, develops the surface tension force, but they're so small that your length scales and they're going so slowly because of their size, the velocity scales become small. When you end up with is that the waves, rather than become do becoming dominated by gravitational restoring forces, become uh, restored instead by the, the tension between molecules. Um, this is probably more detail than you need to know, but uh, Weber number. So. Um, The idea here is oh, this one I was going to skip. Um, so we have these we have these pi terms, right? So I said these are these examples of these common dimensionless groups that we see in fluid mechanics. Um, I also mentioned that when you turn your original problem into a dimensionless expression like this one, the first advantage is that you have fewer variables to work with. So um, I showed this slide before, but what this means is that it's easier to run the experiments, it's easier to actually figure out what this functional relationship is. For example, if you decompose your problem and you end up with only one pi term, maybe this happens if you only have four terms originally, right? For, uh, if, you're, if you only go out to U4 here and you have three dimensions, then what you're gonna get is one single pi term, which then means that that pi term is equal to a constant, okay? Uh, so in order to determine this constant, you theoretically only have to run one experiment. You'd usually want to run an experiment more than once uh, to get some, some confidence in your result. But mathematically, there, that, that, that pi term cannot take on any other value. If you end up with two pi terms, what this means is that the results can be plotted as a single curve. Uh, so if you test over a large enough range, then you can be sure that that by interpolating using some curve fitting technique along your experimental data points, that you have a good estimate of what this functional relationship is inside of that range. Um, and why this is important is because uh, 
is because now if you have a functional relationship between pi terms or dimensionless terms, this is universal. So it doesn't matter what variables go into these pi terms as long as they have the same values. If you have three pi terms, for example, then what you get are a family of curves where you plot for different uh, functions of your third pi term uh, or different con values of your third pi term. And so this, this could also be sort of spread out in space and thought of as a three-dimensional surface. Okay. Um, so the idea here is that you can, if it's constant, it's very easy. If you have two pi terms, you just use a standard curve fitting technique. If you are, have three pi terms, you could use curve fitting techniques on each family here. Um, but it becomes more and more complex to, to, to sort of fit using curve fitting techniques, what this functional relationship right here is. So in a lot of cases, uh, we'll still have, even after doing this process and reducing the number of uh, arguments in our function, we're still going to end up with uh, a functional relationship that's too complicated. We have too many pi terms, and the experiments are going to be too expensive to, 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 uh, to allow us to determine this functional relationship exactly. So instead, um, we sort of shift, shift focus and we say, instead of trying to figure out this functional relationship explicitly, I'm only interested in evaluating one design point. Right? I want to know how a, a, a specific set of pi terms will, uh, or a specific set of variables will affect one problem of interest. And so this is where modeling comes in. It's sort of a different angle on the same problem. Um, if you're designing, if you're coming up with ship resistance, for example, if you're modeling ship resistance, then it's such a complicated problem. It involves every, basically every measure of the ship's geometry, the curvature, the bilge radius, to the mean to depth ratio, to the length of the waterline, and the second derivative of the contour in the propeller plane, etc. That you just have, you have so many variables here that you're going to have a crazy number of pi terms even if you manage to do the dimensional analysis. So instead of trying to figure out a function that describes the resistance of all ships as functions of uh, these dimensionless pi terms, we instead say, all right, I want to design a ship, and I want to come up with a way of estimating its resistance at a full scale, like the full-scale resistance of this using a scaled-down model. Okay, so. Um, the answer is how, into how we do this is through modeling similitude or similarity. And I talked about this a little bit um, on Monday, but I just kind of want to review what I mean by similarity. Um, we have three things, three kinds of similarity that we worry about. Um, generally, we say the prototype is the system we're trying to simulate or we're interested in. And the model is the one that we have access to. This, for example, the prototype would be the full-scale ship. The model is our little toy boat that we put in the towing tank. Um, so geometric similarity is the most intuitive. This basically means you scale down or scale up the, 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 the full-scale, the prototype, to something that you can work with. Um, this means that all of your lengths, your aspect ratios, your angles, uh, are maintained. Okay. I mentioned before that if we sort of think of the definition of similar triangles from geometry, right? If we have one triangle, another triangle is called similar if we can draw it with all the same angles but with different lengths. Same sort of thing goes for a ship model. You scale it down, you maintain all of the same geometric features but at a smaller scale, then you can uh, achieve geometric similitude. Uh, kinematic similitude basically means that your the ratio of model scale velocities to full scale velocities is the same as the ratio of model scale displacements to full scale displacements and model scale accelerations to full scale accelerations. This just means that the flow moves in the same way around your model and that the model moves in the same way relative to its geometry. Um, for example, if we want to ensure, uh, let me, 
this. We want to ensure that if we're simulating, if we're modeling flow around this uh, this blob here, and so we make a geometrically similar blob here. We assume that flow. We have flow separation point here. We have flow here, so these streamlines, and stagnation point there. Then we want to figure, we, we can only trust this model if we know that the streamlines around this are going to behave in the same way. We're going to end up with the same flow patterns. Okay, so that's kinematic similarity. Dynamic similarity is sort of where we're going to hopefully start to see the linkage between this and the dimensionless groups I was saying before. <coughs> Dynamic similarity means you have the same balance between relative forces. Okay. If you have a full-scale model, you know that the separation of the streamline here is going to be some function of, uh, or sorry, the separation of the streamline here is going to depend upon the, the pressures in the flow, the viscosity in the flow that causes this to separate, and the inertia of the fluid particles on the streamline itself. And so you, what you need to do to maintain this same behavior here is say that I want my ratio of viscous forces to inertial forces to be the same. I want my ratio of pressure forces to inertial forces to be the same. Therefore, I need to maintain, or so, and, and in doing so, uh, you know that if you keep dynamic similarity, basically all your F and your MA terms scale equally, depend, no matter what those F and MA terms come from. Uh, if you have dynamic similarity and you have geometric similarity, then it follows that you'll get kinematic similarity. If you have a model that looks the same and flow around that model that has the same relative forces acting on it, then what you're going to get is the same response of the flow, in, at least in the character. It's going to look similar. So, um, so remember, geometric similarity plus dynamic similarity are what we need to shoot for in order to get kinematic similarity. And all three of these are required, geometric, dynamic, and kinematic, are required to, uh, to, to, to get a true model of a system. Um, I've already, oh, that's, that's more than we need to show right now. Um, so, coming back to this, so I've said we need uh, geometric, kinematic, dynamic similitude in order to guarantee that the behavior of the ship is going to somehow be representative of the behavior of the full scale. So, uh, I've shown, right, we talked about up to this point how these dimensionless groups Specifically, Reynolds number, Froude number, Weber number, etc., give us an idea of the balance between one type of force and the inertial force of a, uh, of a fluid particle, right? So, the way we maintain similitude is by maintaining pi terms. That is, if we have a model scale, we plug our model dimensions, the model, uh, the, the viscosity, the velocity, the length scales, and such into our pi terms. We can bet that we're the, if the pi terms are equal between our model scale, which we'll call like pi one n, pi two n, and our full scale prototype, pi one, pi two. If we keep pi one and pi two equal, then we can bet that essentially both sides of the equation here are going to look the same. It doesn't matter whether it's a full-scale ship or a model. This, this, this functional relationship only tells us the relationship between the numerical values of these pi terms and the numerical value of this pi term on this side. So, um, this, uh, not really, this is one of those things where it's probably easiest to show through an example. So let's, uh, in the last few minutes here, try tackling a model scale problem to see if this sort of makes things easier. Um, I don't think we have time to split up into the teams of three or four, but um, let's see if we can kind of do this quickly. 
So we see here, written down for our convenience, kind of all of the terms um, that we are interested in when we're considering the drag on this flat rectangular plate that's placed in the flow. All right, I said this, this may represent something like a billboard in, in, a wind, in, in wind. Uh, so we've got drag is some unknown function of velocity, density, viscosity, width, and height. Okay. So velocity has unit has dimensions of length or time, right? Density, mass, <coughs> length magnitude cube. Mu is a is it mass mass length negative one times negative one w length h length and drag mass length times negative two okay so if we inspect all this what we see is that we have mass we have length we have time all of our terms show up here, so we say R is equal to 3. Over here we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. K equals 6 dimensional uh, variables. So we're looking for 6 minus 3, 3 pi terms. Um, now I terms to save us a little bit of time, but uh, if we pick as our repeating variables, let's say, uh, as our repeating variables, let's pick H, let's pick rho, and let's pick V, rho and V. Those are our repeating variables, and what we end up getting is uh, a functional relationship that says drag Width squared, rho v squared is equal to some unknown function of width over. Sorry, I don't want that to hit the wrong repeating variable. That width over h, rho v width over mu. Um, so we get this just by following those eight steps that we talked about on Monday. Right, the, the, the pi theorem and dimensional analysis. Okay, so let's say this this uh, let's say this billboard is originally the, the full scale one is five meters high by ten meters wide, uh, has a density of air, viscosity of air, and is placed in uh, a a and is placed in a wind current of five meters per second. Okay, so this is a pretty big model. Yeah, this would be a big thing to build and test. It's talking about 50 square meters of, of area here. That'll, that'll, that'll make a boat go, let alone some guy trying to hold it in a wind tunnel. So the idea is we're gonna scale this down. Let's say we wanna test it as something that's closer to the size of a license plate. Maybe, or well, let's say bigger than that, a piece of poster board. Something that's like half a meter by one meter, okay? Now we're talking about a length scale of, of uh, 1 to 10, yeah? So if we want our width here to be now 1 meter, that means that in order to maintain this pi term constant between the model scale and the full scale, that we also have to crank down the h by a factor of 10, yeah? If we want the width to height to be equal between model scale and full scale, to maintain geometric similarity means now if we want this to be half a meter, uh, or we want this to be one meter, h has to be half a meter, and we get equality of our first of our this pi term. Um, viscosity, density, velocity, width, 
what this means now is, uh, let's say we want to test it in a wind tunnel where we can't change the density of the air or the viscosity of the air. So we want um, rho v w mu equal rho model v model w model over mu model. As I said, um, to keep this pi term constant, we have to ensure this. Unfortunately, we're testing in air in both cases, so the density and viscosity, uh, we can't really change. We're not going to play with those very much. This means is now that the velocity times the width has to be equal between the two cases. Um, so if we want to figure out the velocity of the model, we simply say this is equal to the width of the prototype by the width of the model in order to satisfy equality of this pi term. Now because the width of the, uh, or sorry, times the, the uh, velocity of the full scale. So the width to the width of the model we've already constrained by our choice of dimensional, uh, our choice of geometric scale, right? We said we want to scale this down by a factor of 10. This ends up being 10, so we end up with velocity of the model equal to 10 times the velocity of the, uh, the full scale structure, right? This is weird. We're actually talking about turning up the, the velocity now. But this is to, because we have a smaller length scale in order to maintain equality of, if we look at this, this ends up being a Reynolds number. In order to keep the Reynolds number constant between the smaller model and the larger prototype, and to keep the same balance between viscosity and inertia, we actually have to turn up the velocity here. Okay. So then in order to compute the drag, now so if we keep these two terms constant, we can bet then that this term here is going to be the same for the model scale and full scale. And so because we now know our w and our rho and our v for the model scale, if we measure the drag, we can, we can plug in our model scale w or model scale rho or model scale v and come up with this drag coefficient right here. And now to get the full scale result, we can keep the same value of pi 1 equal pi 1 m. So we get this from experiments. We say it's the same for the full scale as long as we've kept these constant. And then we know w rho v squared for the full scale, or for any other scale for that matter. So we simply multiply our drag coefficient, our, our pi 1 term here, by the denominator to figure out what the actual drag on the, um, the billboard is. So that's a quick, hurried introduction to model testing, but this is sort of what underpins the kind of testing we do in towing tanks as naval architects. And so I'd like to get into that more in the next lecture, um, which will be remote, as I said. So we'll not see you guys on Monday, and we'll see you on Wednesday. Have a good weekend.
What? <laughs>